Welcome back to another edition of Intelligence, bringing you knowledge with the power to make change. I'm your host, Brendan Dunn. I am happy to be back with you guys. It's been a, a full week for me, and I got a chance to see the show. Dr. Singleton, you did an excellent job nice. of, uh, no, of uh, <laughs> after the fact of showing up. You, you started off on that rocky road, but uh, you got you in there. Had to, you had to take a jab at me. I mean, but you got in there, though. So I uh, want to go ahead and get started with introductions. Per what I just said, Dr. Rod Singleton, our medical advisor to the stars. I know your name. Thank you, sir. Mr. Damon Parrish. Thank you, sir. My <laughs> His second. I appreciate that. Also, one of the best and smartest and brightest minds that I know in the uh, legal field. And we have joining us today special guest, Crystal Washington. She is an author. She is a speaker. She is all things that black magic and women should encompass. How are you, Crystal? Fabulous. Great. And... Coming on the stage for the first time in her role as the Robin to our Howard Stern is Miss Andrea Soders. She will be joining us because both Charles and Quentin are out today, so we wanted to give some sisters some sisterhood together. I'm just here so I don't get fired. Well, that's it's all good. Um, we got got a lot to talk about today. I mean, we got everything international news. We're talking about South Africa. Uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, the the kerfuffle that is Trump. Uh, we're going to be talking about all things sports related, including uh, the GPA changes for uh, student athletes. And uh, Crystal's going to uh, send us into a tailspin at the end of the show dealing with social media and STEM, which is your science, your technology, uh, and your mathematics and engineering. I mean, it's, it's going to be an exciting show. So uh, we're going to dive right on into it. And we're going to start off with some... Uh, some general news dealing with the inmates uh, in prison. There's been some new talk about uh, inmates staging a prison strike, uh, saying that they are basically being worked like slaves and uh, they're not going to take it anymore. It's interesting because slavery was abolished, but it was also kept alive vis-a-vis -vis the prison industry. Um, prisoners in this country uh, while making up 2.3 million people, which is uh, more than the, the next 16 countries combined in their prison industries, these particular prisoners make, on the federal level, they make about 31 cents an hour. On the state level, they make 20 cents an hour. And uh, that doesn't include overtime. That doesn't include anything else. I think the only thing that they really get is OSHA services. And OSHA has to actually uh, request to come into the prison, in prison complexes before they're allowed in. So it's, it's really, for all intents and purposes, a more than slave, less than equitable um, employee status that they have. Do they have a right and a claim to say that, hey, we are getting, getting treated unfairly? Absolutely. Uh, so um, here's what I'll say. Uh, is it really slavery if it's voluntary, right? Uh, I, if you choose sure. to be part of that work detail, if you choose for other benefits such as good credit towards your parole sentence or for other other intangibles to be part of it, is it really slavery? Um, is it, are they treated fair? No. Are they treated the way a worker outside of prison is normally treated or should be treated? No. But they are in fact in prison. So a lot of things that um, we on the free world have, they don't have by virtue of being in prison anyways. Uh, they don't have freedom of movement. They don't have freedom of voice. They don't have freedom at all. They're in prison. So I, I, I hesitate to say that it's, it's slavery in this sense, in the modern sense. Now, certainly, uh, early in America, when they were forced to be in chain gangs, when they were forced to go outside and do that kind of stuff at, at shotgun, at, at, at gun range, um, uh, gunpoint, then that for sure is a form of modern-day slavery in the prison system. But now that you have the ability to say, no, I don't want to do that, or I do want to do that, and I do want to get whatever measly benefit I'm going to get from it. I don't. I don't know if I can call that slavery. Unfair, yes. Slavery, no. So if if if, if you're addressing the contention that Brennan made, uh, then you know you're off the mark because Brennan didn't say that it was slavery. He said more than slave, less than you know the less than what's deserved to normal civilians. I think the problem here is not necessarily that we should be talking about it in the context of it being slavery, just a humanitarian issue. You have. Any other, any other industry when involving slaves or any, uh, minors or anybody who has any kind of uh, inability to consent fully, 
Because in this sense, the slaves are under duress, right? When you ask them to do something, they are, it's, a, it's a form of duress. They're incarcerated. They have limited options. You can compel them to do things that they would otherwise not want to do because of the, 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 the guarantee or, you know, promise of, you know, freedom or anything like that. So these people don't really have the right to really refuse like we, like you or I would have. And then at the end of the day, they're not, they're paying them, like, they're paying them, in, in Louisiana, I think they're paying them four cents to 70 cents a, 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 an hour. And so, I mean, it's not slavery, but it's tantamount to human rights, rights abuse. If this was anybody in the, in the, in the, in the our, in free society, you would have a problem with it. But here's the thing. I don't think it's fair to make a comparison in, in certain circumstances to free society because by virtue of going to prison, you are forfeiting a lot of benefits you get. But in not your human society. rights, though. True. But is, 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 is the right to be treated as a person in the free world uh, a human rights issue in prison? I don't think so. Well, you bring up a point that I, that I want to delve into, and maybe Crystal, I'll have you talk about this. You know, when, when we talk about the prison system, there, the question that always comes up, especially when I'm, uh, when I'm in trial and we're talking to uh, uh, jurists uh, about the nature of the penal system, we ask them, what do you think the, uh, the, the, the penal system is, 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 is abrogated to, to, to approach? Is it, is it for uh, rehabilitative measures? Or is it for punitive measures? And you get a mix all the time that say, well, I think it's punitive or I think it's rehabilitative. And, and it starts right there with your discussion of what you think a prisoner should be doing and how they should be treated within the penal system. Because if you think it's simply punitive, then you shouldn't have much care at all about the humaneness of what goes on in there. If you think it's rehabilitative, then you should be focused on how they're treated, you should be focused on what they're learning, and you should be focused on uh, the overall effect that it has on them while there, because there are psychological effects that happen. If you continue to beat somebody down and treat them with that slave mentality that Rob is talking about while they're in the prison system, then more than likely, that particular mentality pervades itself once they're out again, saying, well, you know, I, I lived a rough life there, this is all I know, especially depending on how long you were in that particular system. Uh, so, Crystal, my question to you, is do you think we should be giving prisoners the same type of um, consideration when it comes to humane practices vis-a-vis -vis employment and, and learning trades that we would give to somebody on the outside? Well, because I believe that these people, most of them are eventually going to get out, I think that we should consider it. But I don't know... I haven't formed a solid opinion on this one yet, simply because on one hand, yes, we have to consider human rights. We want to make sure that they're treated humanely. I don't believe in corporations benefiting unfairly from slave labor. Um, and I also believe that when these people get out, they need to be productive members of society. And if you beat them down while they're in there, they're not, they're not going to be able to do that. So this is one of those areas where it's a little great for me, honestly. I don't think it's that great for me, personally. I mean, so the question of whether they should be extended humanity like anyone else is, are they human? And what are our principles, right? Principles are things that we adhere to regardless of what the, the circumstances. So but that's we, coming from if, a doctor who's given the Hippocratic Oath to, to do no harm regardless of the situation. No, that, I, I think that's separate and apart from what I'm talking about. If my principles are about due process, if my principles are about humanity, that stuff extends to wherever a human is, regardless if it's prison or it's in the free world. It doesn't matter. These people are, to a certain degree, compelled to do things that they would otherwise likely not do. You wouldn't work for four cents for, for an hour. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it either. It's because of their, their circumstances, Correct. which is unique, why they do this. And these corporations and these prisons themselves can compel them with things that we don't have to, so they don't, we, we don't get subjected to as ordinary free citizens. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how this is a controversy. Well, no, well, no, 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 no. Here's the thing. Um, you get compelled to work for, for money you may not want to work for. Have options. Although, you, you have, they, so here's the thing. I have fruitful in, options. In, in, within the prison system, you, you can't compare it. Now, I think I, I want to limit the human rights argument to just employment. Because I do really, I agree with you that in all respects, there are certain unalienable human rights, no matter where you are, you deserve. But when we, talk about, when we narrow it down to just employment, I think the situation is different. Because by going to prison, like I said, you forfeit certain rights. Um, and the right to choose whether or how much you get paid or negotiate pay salary may be one, may not be. You don't have to work in prison. You can just sit and relax and do whatever you want to do or, or, or whatever they tell you to do. But they will never tell you you have to work. You choose to do that. You, you volunteer for it and you go into it knowing that they will benefit off your workload. Somebody else will. Is it fair? No. But, I mean, you are also in prison. And I agree with Crystal here. 
I think the problem, Brennan, to answer one of your questions is when we ask people what it is versus what it should be. Because what prison is, is, is punitive. That's what it's it not, is. It's not just punitive. Look, what it should be is rehabilitative. And I agree with you guys on that point. And we should be helping these people will get out for the most part. And those that do get out, and especially those who are getting out soon, we should put them on a fast track to something to be productive. Well, I don't I'm think it's, I don't, I don't think, like Rod was uh, uh, pointing out just now, I don't think it is purely punitive. I think, because you can't say it's punitive while also providing prisoners with uh, uh, educational resources while also providing them with vocational resources while also providing them with mental health resources you can't say it's simply punitive when they they have put these other institutions within the prison system to help to be curative for the person now that being said I think part of the problem a, a, a big majority of the problem that I have right now with this quote-unquote slave labor is that is who it benefits it benefits the corporation. Corporations get literally uh, pennies on the dollar for the labor costs that they will then flip and turn a profit, which then means that they perpetuate the influx of prison prisoners coming in because now they have a situation where everybody gets a kickback. The more money I make as a corporation, the more money the prison makes and the more money the government makes on top of that because we now have a system, it's a money-making system. If this was simply a matter of prisoners being forced to, to labor for the good of the people, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have the same question of slave labor. But when it becomes a profit margin issue or for, for corporations, mm -hmm. then it becomes an issue of why do we have them doing this slave labor? And I think well, I think if they work for their own subsistence they, as well, it wouldn't, be a bit, no. it wouldn't be as big of an issue they as don't well. Work. You, no, you that's what I'm saying. If, if they did. It starts, no matter why you're there, if you choose not to do it, you choose not to do it. A corporation can benefit a, a dollar for every hour you make or whatever. And if nobody chooses to work, then, then they benefit nothing. And so at some point, it, it's the inmates make the choice. And for whatever reason, they make the choice to do so. Maybe they're just fucking bored and they would do it for free. Maybe just the, 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 the routine of jail. And if you guys have ever actually visited somebody in prison or been there, the routine of prison <laughs> itself is very fucking horrible. It's very mundane. It, bears, it wears you down. You do the same thing every day, and they want to do something different to break the monotony of the every day. So many volunteer, and we're probably volunteer just for free. I'm not saying they should, or that's fair. But what I am saying is that I don't think it's a fair comparison to say uh, in prison, uh, in the employment situation, it, it, it's a fair comparison between prison and out of prison. Well, we have we want to get a couple of these um, um, viewer comments in, and then we'll move on to the next one because we got so much to talk about. Jordan Hargrove says it depends on the crime. Child molesters should be punished. Nonviolent <laughs> crimes should be rehabilitated. Only problem I have with that particular statement is that eventually some of these violent offenders also get out as well. So I think that, that there has to be a, a rehabilitative method uh, to them, too. Uh, Ruth Ferguson uh, says, you are not factoring the cost of housing, feeding, clothing, and more. Well, done, well above four cents uh, per hour. But I believe they should be treated humanely. It's a pregnant butt. So the, the, the fact that the, the prison industrial complex drives a lot of these, uh, this, this prison population all together in the first place. So we're talking about a problem that we're attributing to the prisoners, but we're not talking about the system that puts all these prisoners unjustly behind bars, which we are well aware of at this point. So that's kind of like the chicken or the egg argument, but I think more in favor of the chicken. So what, that's just my retort to Ruth. All right, well, moving right along, uh, this is actually a, involves a conversation that, both, uh, that I've had with both Andrea and Crystal. 63-year-old. Um, Jermaine Jackson of the Jackson 35. My idol. Um, living his best life. He is living his best, his, his, <laughs> his, the only life he's known how to live. Yo. He's getting, he's announced marriage plans to a 23 year old girlfriend uh, named Made Velasquez. Um, American First of all, congratulations to you, sir, for, <laughs> for, for, for getting rid of the title. I imagine. Like, I imagine. <laughs> this brings up a question for me. Um, and Crystal, we, we've had this conversation ad nauseum at times about <laughs> pedophilia in America and, and also with the age range of, of consummation of, 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 of love. What does this have to do with pedophilia? She's well, 23. Well, here's the, here's the question. Exactly. <laughs> at what age? So, so we start off with pedophilia. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Mean, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We start off with the, the pedophilia age being whatever age the state has set for you as a consenting adult. 
Interestingly enough, in the United States, there are three different ages mm -hmm. where pedophilia is given a legal start. At the age of 16, at the age of 17, and at the age of 18. Arbitrary. Interestingly, even more interesting is that there, the majority of states actually have the, the number set at 16, which includes Georgia, North Carolina, South, South Carolina, Carolina. Uh, going over to Nevada. Uh, most of your, your northern and either eastern states are all at 16. Uh, Texas uh, is in the me medium range of 17 years old, and then you've got some more of your most liberal uh, states, California, uh, Oregon, set at 18 years old. So the question then becomes, you've got the 63 with 23, or is it 63? Oh, is it 63. Yeah, 63 and 23. You've got a 40-year age gap right here. Um, were, he, were he 30 years old <laughs> dating this girl, it would be pandemonium. Um, I, would she even be alive at she that point? Alive. She wouldn't even be alive. So it's uh -huh. be a lot of people. Uh -huh. So, so, <laughs> so, so weird. Were, were he fifty <laughs> years old, this girl would be, th you know, thirteen years old. So or ten years old. Um, at what age are we are we finding ourselves okay? Is it simply because you've met that met that legal threshold and all of a sudden, bam, you're good to go? Half plus seven rule is what I've been taught. Half plus seven. Yes, plus half your age seven. plus seven. That's a respectable age for minimal age for dating a, a, a female. Uh, for, for men. This long? No, I mean it's it's, 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 it's as arbitrary as the states. <laughs> no, no, that that actually but, is. But actually, it's a progressive age scale though. It's not just like oh. You, there's a minimal age, and then once you pass the minimal age. But why age, is it okay that once you hit 16, 17, or 18, it is arbitrary, you can be but it's a better, it's better system than this. <laughs> but why is it that once you hit 16, 17, or 18, arbitrarily, you're all of a sudden, oh, you're no longer a pedophile, sir. You are well within your rights. Because the laws somebody. reflect the collective mores of the society in which the laws were created, right? It does, it's, not, it's an absolute morality. So, pedophilia, no, it's not pedophilia, because pedophilia is a psychological term used to, to describe a person who's primarily sexually attracted to minors, or prepubescent adolescents. He's not that. He is a maladjusted, maybe. He is... Why is that maladjusted? I mean, this is a virile, me, 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 me virile old man. Can I finish? He's a, he's a virile old man that wants a girl who's younger than his daughter. Younger than his, his grandchildren. What is maladjusted about that? He sees some sexy asses like, so you know So let me what? ask you something. Does the average, did the average, does the average sexagenarian you see, man, is he, is he walking around with the 20-year-old female? If he could get yes. them, yes, he would. That, if, that's, that's the, the answer is the average rich Listen, I'm not, I'm, not hating on, I'm not hating on Jermaine Jackson. If anything, this is a testimony. How but you money, want me to ask your question. No, but listen, you already, you already cut me off, so I'm cutting you back off. So let you me make my point. Question. No, no, you, I didn't finish. <laughs> please, sir. Let me, allow me, please. It's please, all right. You have, you have the floor. You talk 50% of the time. It's all right. So what I'm saying is I'm not mad at Jermaine Jackson. If anything, this is a testament to how money rules the world and money's the great equalizer. Because I guarantee you, he ain't getting off his conversation, his intellect, his pipe game, or nothing. It's all about the, it's all about the dollars. And what if he is? So big up. So if you, if you mad at Jermaine... I'm with you. And, if and this, because this, it would, it would be different if this was actually an underage girl. This is a 23-year-old woman. No, she's probably not fully formed and developed at 23, but she she's old enough to make her, she makes her own, she's old enough to make her own decisions. And so, yes, she's probably exchanging her youth and beauty for his, his security. And if they're is, both, isn't that what normally happens? Well, yes, but in this case, I'm saying she's of age, so I have nothing to say about uh, it. So, okay. Well, you know, so, Listen, so, so what? He, why he, is didn't, it? he didn't go to a high school and say, "Hey, let me help you with your geometry homework." I mean, this, this is a moment. So, what if she was 18? Just, just hit the threshold. I'd be like, okay. Listen, you'd be like, okay, Andrew, Andrew, <laughs> Andrew, what do you think on that? <laughs> I would agree with Crystal. Um, I'll take it the easy road. No, out. she's of age. Why? I don't Crystal understand didn't how. Like, well, I guess, the, I guess I see what Brenda's saying is we're saying she's of age because we have been indoctrinated with seventeen being of age. Right. Now, what if what if of age is twenty five? What if the age of consent in Texas is twenty five? Would you still feel the same way? Yes, because that's what we've agreed on as a society. So, that, so it's, but you've agreed on it based like if this was a if this was a nineteen year old. Dating a, a fifteen year old, you would call him the dredges of society. You would you would you would say he's a pedophile, he's a sex offender, he's all this stuff. Only there's a forty year difference here, and all of a sudden, just because she's above the age of eighteen, you know what? You just gotta let people live how they live. But Carpe you, diem. Let me ask you a question. But you all up in arms about this? We agree. This I'm is not all, I'm, I'm, I'm up in arms it? about. You know what? Go ahead. Go ahead. So you are up, you you kind of you kind of making a cir circular argument. You're, you're mad that this that the age of consent is arbitrary, which we agree that it's arbitrary. It comes from nothing but what I say, a collective sense of morality, what, what that dictates, right? But what age would you have it be? It's still going to be arbitrary. But we've agreed as a society that those ages are what constitutes 
the age of consent. So what age would Brendan Dunn, if you could rule the world, would be the age where there would be no question and you would be fine with any woman dating any man of any age? It's funny that you assume what I was upset about because you're absolutely wrong you about what stated. I was upset, upset about. What I was upset about was what society has deemed as what they're going to put the, the, the criminality on. Not necessarily that the age is arbitrary, but the fact that you have, you have now demonized people because of what you've arbitrarily put the age at. There's a difference. But even at the age that. that Brennan Dunn decides, that same thing will happen. Well, you so will not change that. I actually want to carry a hypothetical Brennan said to Crystal and uh, Andrea. If it was a 19 and 15 year old, would you have a problem with that? A 19 and 15 year old? I mean, if the 19 year old, if I was related to the 19 year old, like this isn't a smart decision for you. Well, well, I, I don't, I don't know if. Outside of legality, would you have a problem? I'll, with no. That? Now, with legality, you would because the law says, right. uh, and that's, that's the only reason. Right, because well, 19 and 15, they're still, they're not that different. Yeah. Psychologically, it's life experiences, it's not that different. Oh, yeah. well, well, Malikum Salam, my brother. <laughs> you look the part. All right, so we're moving right along. We've got a... Uh, I, I do want to say this, Raphael Mercury... Okay, I guess we're not moving right now. Raphael Mercury's been hitting on the head on this issue. His comments have been on point, and I appreciate that. Go ahead, That's Brian. my boy. All right, so... You make it am, am I allow, allowed to move you make, you right may pass. You may pass. Bro. Thank you. This too shall pass. Um, so, HBCUs, we all know what they are. They are historically black colleges and universities. Uh, seem to be getting a bump and an increase in student involvement and um, um, uh, patronage. However, interestingly enough, interesting is going to be the, 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 the word du jour. Interestingly enough, it is not black students who are forcing this increase in patronage. It is white students. Uh, over the last, I'd say, 17 years, they've had a, a I think it's a, a uh, 7% increase in the total number of HBCU students that are going, and it has been the white population now making up 17% of the total HBCU populace. PWIs, which are predominantly white institutions, uh, have not seen that kind of growth from the black community going into the PWI institution. Should we be upset or should we be happy that white people are now embracing the black college experience? I mean, they've always embraced black culture. That's, not, that's nothing new. Uh, so why not? I'm mean, trying to steal some of this poverty. I mean, you know, this colonization works every which way but loose. So you know, why not? I mean, if they want to come to uh, HBCU, let them come. I mean, all are welcome. Have a good time. Learn. As long as you come and recognize where you are and the significance of where you are and the aspect behind it and, and not try to import your own European values to it and say, well, it should be like this. If you respect where you are, then why not? Uh, so, I'm personally, personally, <laughs> I, I have a response to that. Which <laughs> you you want to go first? No, 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 please, Dr. Singleton. So, I'm ambivalent, personally. Mm -hmm. So, on one hand, I'm a pro-black traditionalist. I value, I think there's a lot of value in HBCUs as a tradition and the benefit that they, they confer on our community. Uh, on the other hand, I think that growth outside of the uh, a particular de demographic is, grow is, is good for any institution, whether it be uh, political, whether it be uh, social, whether it be academic or otherwise, it's, it's, it's a good thing. And on one hand, this, this may be a bellwether for how our institutions are being perceived by, you know, those who make up the majority of our population who kind of drive, you know, for better or worse, what's acceptable. Um, and on the other hand, I'm, I'm kind of wary of it because, again, this seems like it may pose a threat to black traditions. Ultimately, if you have a population increase that's being driven by non-black people, then they're going to be alumni, then they're going to be able to vie for positions on the boards at some point, and they're going to change the makeup altogether. And then it's going to cease being the HBCU that we come to lo love and value. But, you Maybe. know, it, it depends. So I don't, I don't know. I'm happy and I, I'm, on, I'm on the fence about it. It Chris, depends on what the trends go. Chris, I'll let you go before I... I mean, I went to a PWI, so I don't have any strong attachment to HBCUs personally. That's just my experience. But what I do know um, is that with this other population coming in, it's going to drive up the cost of those universities as well. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that would be the concern, how it affects the, the black population there in terms of financials. Are you done? Because I'm about to go, to go in on, on, on you guys uh, and, you know, with, with, with love. Uh, as the only one, I believe, in here that went to an HBCU. Uh, hello. Law school. 
I'm sorry, undergraded. Okay, so grad school doesn't really count for for. for but you're not the only one that went to one. Carry that's on. so, sure. You only went because you couldn't get in a PWI. That's uh, what you meant. Nah. Ooh. I only went because those are the only schools that I wanted to go to, and those are the schools that I applied to. Thank you very much. Sure. Just I'm because you didn't want that black experience. PWI paid for my entire education, so I'm with you. They, they were so, like, hey, So anyway, you PWI girl. people, um, HBCUs are the cornerstone for black education. Uh, we, we were the ones, or by we were the ones, HBCUs were the universities that accepted people when the PWIs told us we weren't good enough yeah. to go there. Now, all of a sudden, you fast forward. They started, I believe, in 1967 was the first uh, uh, HBCU, um, uh, where they, they started that whole HBCU thing. All of a sudden, now, we're in 2018, and it's the cool thing to do to be a part of this black experience of the collegiate experience where we have the bands, we have the soul, we have the, the fun, we have the, the a certain, there's a certain level of, of experience that you get when you go to an HBCU campus. I'm not going to take anything from you guys going to your wonderful institutions, but if you went to an undergraduate de degree program at an HBCU, you know that there is something about it that doesn't compare to going to a PWI institution. You can say the same thing. You can say the inverse. I mean, I was about to say, wait, what? That's not, that's well, not, that's not the same. Thing. Because you didn't go to a university where all you walked around and saw were other black people. Did you go to, you a, didn't, you didn't, did you go to a football game on a Saturday with 60,000 people in the stands? Yes, I've been to those. At a black and university. It's, and it's, so, so what's funny? At a black it's university. Cute. It's wrong? cute because you have those bands doing what they do. It works, it works, it cuts both ways. All those bands that y'all do with your, with your, with your three-fourth time, okay, that's great man. and all. Okay. But I'm talking so, about, I'm I'm talking about drum majors coming down, room. bending backwards. Went you went to HBU, I, sir. You have nothing to say that can even be part of this conversation. You know what else I didn't have to worry about? My school losing accreditation. Oh, word. That's true now. Just that. Because, I mean, I have friends that had that experience that went next door. I'm just throwing that well, out. Well, let me let me say Xavier University of Louisiana has never <laughs> had those kind of problems. And let's also say that PWIs fail and falter all the time. They do. Hey, so let's not act they like do. this is just somebody, somebody, somebody else has the but, kind of, but you're making the comparison <laughs> between HBCUs and PWIs, and I'm the only person that went to both. I cannot agree with what you said. I do. Both of them have different experiences and, and different walks for sure. You, but 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 what you I what you're saying there, and I still say this, I'll say this. It takes a special person to be white and want to go to an HBCU, uh, you you have to you have to be more than just uh, I, I would say poor. Sorry, uh, not poor, no, not really. I mean, because right. because there, there are tons of you have to be socialized. You you have to want to go somewhere. You have to be socialized. No, that's what I'm saying. It's, 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 it's not even about a poor really, thing. No, no, I'm being I'm being facetious. But I'm saying you get those scholarships. Come on, that's the only reason. Why black people? Why seventy percent? White people aren't going there simply because they they uh you know what? I've always wanted to go to Houston Tillerson. You have to be a special person to to want to jump into a culture that is not yours, knowing everybody would view you as the enemy. A special person who doesn't want a certain level of loan. Uh, hey, listen. I, I'm not gonna narrow down. Can I can I can I address your point? Because you, you contradicted yourself. <laughs> you started talking about you started attributing the the move uh, to why white people into HBCUs and started coming up with all these ideas of why they were going there for the culture and the experience. And you just now pointed out what I think is the biggest driver. It is economics. It is finances. These are they're, they're knowing that they can get quality education at a lower cost. That's probably what's driving. How do they know what they're missing if they don't know what they're missing? Though they don't know. They're not. They're not, they're not intimately familiar unless they're one of those white people that he's talking about, which I think are the majority of these people who are already socialized to be, you know, socialized to be comfortable around black people. But I think they're even a minority. So you kind of contradicted yourself. The bottom line is, don't come for us because we didn't send for you, nor did you send for us to come into your universities. You still don't want us in your universities. You still have. Have bonfires at A and M saying saying how much you hate us. Yeah. So don't don't come this way. So you want to fight exclusion with exclusion. Yeah. No, I want I want us to be in a safe place until we have to go out into that world. Are we safe unsafe. when our best talent is still not going to our HBCUs either? And we're still <laughs> in a safe what? place. What? No, that's a whole different. No, it's it's it's, it's, it's related. How you, that's a whole I, different. I, 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 and I, I don't. See, you're still in a safe place. An HBCU is still an HBCU. Just because there's a few extra white people there doesn't mean it's not a safe place. A except when they start shooting up the club. Man, knock it off, bro. Let me tell you something. I tell you something. I've been to plenty of black clubs also, and I saw never, it have you, pop out, so. How many times have you heard about uh, uh, HBCU having a, having a uh, mass shooting? What, what do you define a mass shooting? I, mean, uh, I, mean, I, mean, I was at TSU I mean, where they were shooting in the neighborhood all the time. That's, that's not a mass shooting. That's okay, just shooting well, in the hood. Right, right, that's I'm a difference. Up. There's I'm a big just, difference. Statistically, how likely to be shot in either environment? I don't actually want the answer. My no, point it's is, only HBCU, for sure. You know, 
But what? you see what I'm saying? Statistically, your chances of being shot are much higher at an HBCU. I would, you I would, I would venture to guess. Them. Get the Listen, fuck out of here. Bro, let me tell you. You are being ridiculous right First of right all, there. I'm not disparaging HBCUs. I wanted to attend the HBCU, but for the logistical purpose, they didn't have my major at the time, so I had to go across the street to, Georgia, uh, to Armstrong Atlantic, now Georgia Southern. But I wanted to go to Savannah State, but they did not have the program. So I'm not, I don't have this thing against HBCUs. I support HBCUs. But I'm telling you, bro, I know that I, I am keenly familiar with WSAV on Savannah Channel News every morning, uh, every other every other month talking about somebody got shot on campus or some other shit. <laughs> you know what's up. I'm okay with them coming if they're willing to pay a higher tuition. Right, they they have to fund the school. Then home. they have to be under contract to like be a, a mandatory booster. Right? They had to be a mandatory booster once they graduate. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just, bad, shit. Bad what? <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah, you you, you, on, you PWI vagabonds. Uh, all right. So, moving right along. We've got... Uh, Going back to the Jackson family, um, <laughs> not my segues cannot be uh, defeated today. Uh, the entertainment giant known as Disney is suing, saying that hey, uh, the people that are that, 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 or that they're actually being sued because. Uh, the, this, the Michael Jackson, they, they did this documentary, The Last Days of Michael Jackson, and they wanted to input uh, some of Michael Jackson's um, music and, and, and his videos into the, uh, into, the, into the documentary. The Michael Jackson estate is trying to stop it all. And Disney's saying, well, hey, um, y'all are going, y'all are being super overzealous with this whole copyright infringement thing. This is the same Disney that at, at the drop of a hat will send cease and desist letters to mom and pop stores for selling Disney merchandise, mm -hmm. will send cease and desist letters to regular people simply for saying Disney too many times in their social media. Um, it, it's almost, they, they have the audacity to have this kind of hypocritical approach to copyright infringement. Uh, is Disney in the wrong on this? Or should we let bygones be bygones? And intellectual property is intellectual property, man. If Disney owns the rights to something, then they should have the right to, to determine how that product is used per our patent, our copyright laws. I don't understand why this is, because we feel that this particular issue is relevant to the children. Well, I mean, <laughs> laws are laws, and you guys as attorneys should understand the importance of following the law and having it equally, you know. <laughs> we should all understand that. <laughs> exactly. The so, of the law. So I don't see how this is a big deal besides the whole narrative about this being children who are being, being uh, targeted, quote-unquote, on this particular story. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I don't want to talk about Disney because they're boring me. Yeah, uh, so yeah. let's talk saying. about something that's more, if, if way more interesting. Lying, I don't care. So. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you look like a movie. All, all those, Coco is a beautiful movie. Can you feel though. the love tonight? Yeah. Yeah. Coco was a good movie. Yeah, that, was a great I movie. Was, that was nice. I like that like Disney's movies. finally decided to uh, add some, some culture into the movie. Yeah. Yeah. If person. you haven't heard of Coco, can we talk about how we don't have a strong black princess in Disney? Like, like, I just, I literally wow. just named one. No, in the press, I mean, in, uh, Princess Frog, she, she had like 10 minutes of screen time, spent the entire movie as a fucking frog. We've, there's no other Disney cartoon where the main character, Princess, is portrayed as anything other than a princess but Princess and a Frog. All right, we'll Tiana, talk, trust we'll, me. We'll, we'll talk about it later. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you talk about that as, as, a, as a blog entry? Because we also do blogs. Matter of fact, uh, Rod just put out a blog today. Uh, and I'll let you guys talk about it. It's about power. And but the day before that, another blog on oh, code switching. Well, that, Check it out. That's awesome. Uh, let's go over <laughs> to the international news. Something real interesting is going on over in South Africa. Yes. Um, the South African government has, for the last several months, been talking about seizing land from farm from white farm over white South African farm owners uh, in an effort to expropriate uh, the the land that was taken from the black South Africans during apartheid. White South Africans are fearful, up in arms, enraged. Um, they are running amok, calling, calling for anyone with white ears to hear to help them, saying that they are, they, they are worried about their lives, they're worried about everything under the sun. Uh, the interesting thing, again, about this is that the government has... has, has is paying for the land, but they're paying for it way below the market value of the land. It's almost like ten cents on the dollar of what mm -hmm. the market value actually is worth. Uh, one, one, the first, the, the first piece of land that they purchased back, I think the uh, family wanted 25, 25 million uh, 
not $25 million for it, and they got like $2.5 million for it. So 10% of what the value of that's, that's too much. Um, wow. So the, and, 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 you, and you bring up the point that I want to get to. First of all, these are South African citizens. Should the government be treating, regardless of what happened in the past, should the government be treating these people as if they're not citizens by snatching the land back from them? I mean, this is purportedly land that was taken by their fathers and forefathers, not by them. So, should they get the punishment for this? Yes. So, so let me ask you a question. <laughs> I, it, 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 I'll tell you why it's fascinating. Because how far do you want to go back when you want to talk about original land ownership, right? We can argue that, like where I'm from in the low country, that land has been stolen from our people and expropriated by, by whites. And a lot of times, you know, if you take that further back, you had in, uh, Native Americans who inhabited those lands before that. So who really owns the land? How, who, who has the right to, pull, to file a grievance against another party and state that this is our original land? I understand the circumstances are a little different here because we kind of know who the original you know, people are. But we but, know who the people before that were. Yeah, but who's... Who does, who's the arbiter of whose land it was in the first place? And, and, and so, to that same point, what what about the adage to the victor go the spoils? I mean, once once you are conquered, the the rule of thumb is that you take and, over. And that's what's going on. Now they're being conquered as well. And so now the new victor, the government, is saying we're taking this shit back. I have no problem with that. <laughs> Chris, I, I, I mean, I, I'm glad I'm not alone on this one. I have no problem with that. Take that shit back. Two million dollars is too much. They didn't give the people they stole from $2 million. They gave them a kick in the ass and got to get the hell out of here. They didn't get no reparations for the land they stole. No, fuck that. If South Africans, if the government wants to take the land back and give it to their people, absolutely, no complaints from me on that. Plymouth front. Zebra didn't land on them. They right. landed on Plymouth Zebra. So, as, far as, as far as them, uh, it's also the comment about them being citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that is defined by the country. Uh, in the United States, it's defined by birthright, and it's defined by being ordained or given through the, through the, uh, through, through the government itself. Each country can define how uh, they determine citizenship and the rights given. The land, ultimately, in every in every country, belongs to the government. It is given to you by by the government to the people. They can take it back from you whenever they want. Uh, in that they are taking it back from the people who stole it from the people. You know, in the Bible it tells you the sins of the father passed down on the son. It's not always nice. It's not always fair. But in this circumstance, they the government is righting a wrong better than. Um, what I've ever seen anyone else the do. The Bible also tells you to turn the other cheek. <laughs> well, there's a Bible verse. I know, but I'm, that's what I'm saying. I, I agree with you. That's how ridiculous. You know, there's a Bible verse. Crystal, you, you, you gave a sitting ovation. Uh, speak up. Um, no, I mean, I, I really don't have too much to add to what Damon said, but I, one thing I guess I will throw in there, though, is that you do have to be careful, though, because I understand what they're doing, and I, I don't think morally it's incorrect for them to do it. The problem that you're going to run into, though, is that as people start to leave the country because that's unfair, you're going to start to see the same type of issues you had in Uganda where their economy starts to collapse because mm -hmm. now you have the countries that they're running to, now they start putting tariffs on the country. You, just, you see what I'm saying? So you have to look at the long-standing economic impact, but morally, I don't think it's wrong. You know, I, really? I, I think uh, even on that economic stance, I think you, you might, you will definitely encounter some hiccups. It will not be a smooth transition, but it cannot be overcome. Um, Africa in itself should be the richest continent in this, in this world. They have more resources than anybody. If, if, the, if this forces the economy to change in favor of that continent and being self, I have no problem with it. I think it will adjust. I think it will change. I think it will be a problem, but they will overcome it. In a, in a perfect so. world, but when we've seen historically what's happened when African countries really try to take control of their own resources, you saw what happened to Patrice Lumamba, you saw what happened to Kwame Nkrumah, I mean, all these different people historically, it's, it's probably not going to end well yes. for the leaders. Furthermore, we're talking about whether it's righteous to retake land. I think we all agree that the land belongs to the people who it belongs to. But we're talking about a, a just practice. We're talking about due process. How they repatriate the land is, is another question. And what they're doing right now is just unjust. You can't give somebody 10 cents on the dollar for what the land actual value is. That's not right to, regardless of the circumstance. Like, but their argument is that you can yeah, because the, the, the government place. sets the price on what they want. Eminent domain, they actually set the price of what they want. To so we're talking again. We're talking about the law because we've been having this little back and forth today. Laws are arbitrary; they don't necessarily reflect morality, right? So it, you're saying so, that, so, so. So you're saying it's unjust, not illegal. It's unjust, not illegal. Yes, okay. but uh, but according to the articles I read, this is not this does not comport with the previous practices 
of uh, of grabbing land, and it it's, and it's against the law because they, they weren't given a chance to uh, uh, address it in court. Well, so what they're arguing is that it's still they're trying to push the boundary of the current constitution that they have right now. Uh, they're in the process of trying to change the constitution to be able to take the land without without any other recourse from the uh, from the landowners. Right now, there's supposed to be an appellate process in place, which they're currently in the process of doing their appeal on this. However. Um, the government is trying to see just how far they can stretch the current constitution to see it, the boundaries by which their court system will allow them to do it. And right, so this is the first of many land grabs by the government. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because we've also got um, European nations and our own president uh, calling for the protection of these uh, white South Africans and their land ownership, saying that, uh, you know, bring us your weak and your downtrodden just in case something does happen to you, which is interesting because we always get to cherry pick the type of immigrants that we think are the qualified immigrants to be illegal immigrants. But that's neither here nor there. Um, moving right along, like I said, we got a lot to go through. Uh, Germany. Uh, has called for a new global payment system. Uh, in case you don't already know, the U.S. dollar is considered to be the international uh, currency for business exchange. Uh, all monetary um, uh, interactions with mo international business happenings happens with the U.S. dollar. Uh, Germany has said, look, we've given the U.S. too much power with the dollar being the main arbiter of, of, of currency exchange because anytime something happens where sanctions are given, uh, anytime that, that there's an international incident where the U.S. tries to set a policy on international uh, activity, we are beholden to them because the U.S. bank holds that particular currency. We need to find a new type of currency, a new international currency that's not beholden to the U.S. banking system. Um, I kind of think that, that Germany's right on this. I mean, you, we, as much as we consider ourselves to be a superpower, we are not the only power, and it is hubris to think that we should be the ones who dictate everything simply because we are America. Do you have a problem with it, though? Why? Why? why, why well, don't, you, don't you want your country to be the strongest country? Yeah, I, I want it to be the strongest country, but I also understand that <laughs> at, uh, simultaneously, when we're talking about a worldview, I think... I wouldn't want somebody else with that kind of power. Exactly. So why would I want, I, I guess I'm not the hypocritical kind of person to say, well, if not you, then me. Why not create a better system that will actually uh, be, equi uh, you know, have the equanimity for all people? But it won't. Because in order for you to have a, a world currency, you have to have the entire world agree upon this currency. You can't exclude That's a single power. economy to that. You have to have the entire world's economy agree upon every last policy. The entire world's economy buy into it. It is never going to happen. It is never going to happen. You will never have consensus of thought, of practice, of law. You will never have consensus, consensus of buy-in. So the, the, the alternative to having the U.S. back dollar, the dollar be the, the back to the, the economy, this global economy, you have to make it fair. Like I said, have everybody involved, and it will never happen. It would, just, it, would, it would collapse upon itself. But the, Euro, the U.S. dollar isn't even the strongest dollar out there, though. So it's just like we're, we're, we're the mediocre ones still setting no, not the, the standards. Ones. It's not the strongest, but, we're not the weakest. Well, the, the problem, we're mediocre. We're, we're right there in, in that, that gray area. The problem, as I understand it, is the fact that with the U.S. backing out of it, they still want to be able to continue with the Iranian deal, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that when they're using, even if they use their own money, if they have to go through the SWIFT bank, right, Sanction. to do it, well, U.S. can place sanctions against them, right? And so the question is, even if they take out the U.S. dollar, they're still going to have to get around the fact that SWIFT Bank and its member cooperatives could actually be pinged by the U.S. And this is where I think blockchain may come into effect, because there's actually an altcoin called Ripple, which is the competitor of SWIFT, and it's not beholden to any one government. So they might even be able to look at some cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. as an alternative option They've been to get down around all this. They've too. They've been finding ways to, you know, not even to, to regulate cryptocurrency. They have? And it hasn't, been, it hasn't been as, it hasn't been what people have thought it was going to be. You know? well, and, and this is, so there's, you know, there's hundreds of cryptos, right? right? And yeah. so I'm not telling people to invest or anything like that, but Ripple is a very special example because it was only created as an alternative for SWIFT. It's only about moving money between banks. It's only for banking institutions. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I said this might be something they can look into to kind of get around this whole problem. Well, I don't Overall, I don't know what you have against American power. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a jingoist or anything like that. I, I understand like yes, there's certain things that I 
country does that I don't really agree with on principle or mor mor morally, but I don't think this is one of them. I, I like our country to be strong. So. I don't I don't have a problem with our country being strong, nor do I have a problem with our country being uh, powerful. But I have, what I do see is the merit of that argument in saying that uh, one country should not hold the power to put a freeze on every other country's international plans. If if 10 other countries within the UN don't want to back the I I Iranian uh, sanction deal, then just because you, the U.S. says so, it shouldn't happen. But the power is the rationing device. If these people didn't fear U.S. power, U, the U, U.S. did not have the power to reinforce what they want, then it wouldn't be happening. So what you, what you, what you, what you, what you're ultimately happen. arguing, though, is that you want us to be weak enough to, that this wouldn't go. The only way that this would happen is if we weren't as strong as we were. And the alternative would be that we would be weaker. And I don't think you want that. I think you're, 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 you're speaking with hubris at this point because no, it's not you're assuming it's that the U.S. is the only only power that can do what it does. We are doing it. Yeah. I'm talking about... I'm talking Demonstrably about, true. Yeah. With the dollar, what you're talking about in terms of uh, military might. No, with and, and that's not the case. Listen, anymore. listen, we're not talking about isolating one variable. We're talking every variable being factored in. The U.S. is doing it. You're decrying how unfair it is, but yet we're doing it because we have the power to levy to, to leverage against anybody who doesn't want us to do what we're doing. And so there you, are others that can do that. As so why well, are they not though. doing it, Brennan? <laughs> that's the whole purpose of Ge Germany has a stronger dollar. They nipped that in the bud already. <laughs> what do you mean they? What do you mean? <laughs> that's dead. That's that's not going to happen. I, don't hasn't been to I, I like what Ruth Ferguson said. She said if two parties in the USA can't agree on things, <laughs> you, want the, you want that on the global stage. And that is, Man, to me, that is, that is a, a very true statement because without going to the who, what, why, I mean, if we, you can't find the consensus with, among two people. The people with power are never going to want to give it away. So, of course, we're going to argue about that. All I'm doing, all I'm speaking to is the merit of the argument, not that I want the U.S. to be at the bottom of the barrel. Let's be clear about that. Um, Moving right along. Your argument has no merit. Let's be clear about that. I mean, that was very muddy what you so said, either. sir. I couldn't <laughs> quite hear you over your bullshit. I think your argument I has la, 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 merit. La. And you're a fraud. Your mama knows <laughs> you're a fraud. <laughs> 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 I, was, I said it. What, I said what it. What do you say? I can hear you say That's okay. Anyway, moving right along. Over to, let's, let's have some fun with sports. Sports is always fun for me. Um. So a report just came out, um, and a Houston Rockets uh, co developmental coach came out and said that um, the NBA players represent, at, at least 40% of the NBA players have a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. um, and Damon, you and I talked about it a little bit. It's, it said it's, it's, it's a pervasive issue and one that he would venture to say is even higher than 40 percent i agree um and we've seen it happen Tom. we've seen it. what's uh, uh uh lebron's daddy uh um what's his name the 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 delante west yeah there we go delante west lebron's daddy um uh, we've yeah, seen it with him We've seen it time and time again. I mean, we saw it with Lamar Odom. We've seen it um, with, with multiple players within the, 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 the franchise or within the NBA uh, go down in a sad, mm -hmm. sad and fiery blaze. Is this just an NBA issue? And what type of mental health issue do you think it is? Now, and you and I had the argument. You said you thought it was a, a matter of mania. Or or, by, or man, uh, manic depressive. Look at these so physicians not, in here with their medical degrees. I would say, manic, degree. I would say manic depressive <laughs> is a form of mania. Uh, I mean, yeah, so to clarify my position, uh, and, and I do I work with a lot of mental health people. I'm not a doctor of medicine. I'm not a doctor of law. But my, but my, your lane, bro. my area of, of practice but, deals with mental health people. So, And you're not a mental health expert also. Nor are you I'm a so, legal expert. Really? So, so stay in your lane. lane. But you so, always so, talk to us about the law. Always. Uh, well, but what I will say is this: when I, when I, the reason why I think that is, is I see a lot of people who will self-medicate when they have a form of mental health illness, bipolar, whatever. They'll self-medicate with usually drugs. That's the most common one. But that's not the only form of self-medication. I think when when athletes to develop the talent they have and the dedication and and the work ethic, that is a lot of good things. But also, to me, could mask a form of self-medication. Whether they're using drugs, they're just using basketball and the extremeness of that. A lot of athletes do things in across a variety of sports, including like weightlifting and football, basketball, that the average person just wouldn't do. They're dedicated to a craft that's beyond, to me, beyond the normal person. And I think that to me is a form of a sign of some form of media. Now, it may not be like 
to the detriment we see of normal bipolar, where like this person is dangerous and may just be a really mild form, mm -hmm. something that is that is that is that is uh, imperceptible or unperceivable. But I think there's something more more to it than than just the that it's just a person who's truly dedicated and that's it. Well, Ron is foaming at the yeah, manic yeah, mouth, yeah. Uh, so go ahead and speak on it. I wasn't foaming at the mouth. I'm just I was just listening intently. Um, I surmise that there are likely more mental health complications in professional sports than in the general public. And that's uh, admittedly without any empirical evidence to substantiate that, right? But if you're familiar with the stress diathesis model, which is a psychological theory which seeks to explain how mental illness manifests itself, basically it looks at it as being a, a mixture between predisposition and stress being a, a catalyst for the, the manifestation of those things. If you think about professional athletes, they're under a tremendous amount of stress just by virtue of the job they do. Uh, if you think about their coping mechanisms, a lot of their coping mechanisms are flawed because these guys represent some of the most, the, the most machismo men that are out there. They subscribe to a lot more of the toxic masculinity, uh, ideas of masculinity than any of us. You know, if they're hurt, they don't want to talk about it. You know, they kind of, they have brains, so they're, they're less likely to seek outward help. So these people, I feel, are at an increased risk for mental health complications. I think if you, if you, if you make the assumption that they are, if they have the same prevalence across the board as the general population is, you would have to assume that. And, and I agree with you, and unlike Damon, a doctoral response. <laughs> unlike Damon, I, I actually go on the other, opposite side of that and uh, think that it's more of a depressive issue and not a manic issue uh, because the stand, like you were saying, the standard is so high that any falter within that, I mean, puts you, put you in that, 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 that psychological spiral down with saying, I'm not measuring up. You are critiqued from day one on everything that you do. Uh, so when these guys come out here, they are fighting to to be the best. And if anybody is above them, all of a sudden it's like, well, damn, I worked all day, all night, 24 hours a day uh, for the last 15 years to get here. And all of a sudden, I'm and within a minute, I'm looked at as, as a buffoon who, who can barely shoot the ball, even though out of 300 people that are in the NBA, you're, if you're 301, you are still better than 75 million other people yeah. that, that are trying to play basketball. Uh, so, so I think that it becomes a matter of, of depression but just and not necessarily mania. So just to clarify, right, you guys are making it seem like it's this dichotomy between mania and depression. There are a lot more different, uh, uh, different illnesses or disorders that fall under the umbrella of mental illness that these guys are subject to. Agree. You, have, you have schizophrenia, Agree. you have personality disorders, totally. you, have, you have a whole bunch of different things. It's not just a, a decision between whether these guys are likely more manic or whether they're Absolutely. depressed. Absolutely. So Agree, that's but, just, but, just, but we've also chosen which psychological disorder we think that they... But it's incomplete. Okay. So uh, they, they well, no one said that, that, that we don't believe that there are some schizoaffected people out there. All right, right, right. right, right. right. Oh, I'm sorry, I zoned out when you said sports. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> Falling into the trap of womanhood. Yeah, I said it. I'm not going to touch that today. We're not going to do that today. Well, you you said it. No, there's a so, lot of women that love sports. I'm just not one of them. Fair enough. But, fair enough. But um, Godspeed to the to all of the athletes. So these athletes, before they get to that pro level, they start off at the collegiate and the uh, high school level. And at that high school and collegiate level, they've now started a new thing where they are changing the GPA standards. Uh, the GPA standards, um, one institution has uh, lowered the standard to a 1.0 GPA. I think that's like, what, a D minus? It's, it's just Ds. Is it a, Literally, is, is it a D minus? Isn't it a D minus? Yeah, like a 1.0 like is a like, 70. It's, it's above, no, what, the 70 is like a C or something. No, it's a D, it's I, don't, I don't know, I've never had one, so. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking that the got issue, no huh? Got no D. <laughs> Wait. See, oh. this, this, this is intelligent, so we're we going to keep it above board on this one. But anyway, boy, you almost made me go there. Um, let, me, let me get a second to, to, to gather my thoughts. All right, so um, it's interesting because we have always held out this with the, the auspice that education goes hand in hand with sports and that in order to get to in order to, 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 to be in sports you also at least on the collegiate level they've always prided themselves on saying hey we get educations here as well our educational standard is supposed to be met with our athletes with this it, it, it just tells you exactly what it is we really don't care about you as the individual we care about what you can do for our institution 
They are making the argument, though, to say, well, hey, we're still caring about the, inst the, the, the educational value because what this does, it allows people to come into the, to, the, to the collegiate forum that might not necessarily otherwise get there because they had below a 2.5 GPA. So this expands the reach that we have with our student athletes. So BS? Yes, BS. I think so so. The, the, the concept of the student athlete has largely been debunked. I think if you look at the origins of the student athlete, there was never a student athlete to begin with. The Ivy League schools started off paying athletes from the get-go. The get they used that as a means to rope in and rein and control their product. Now, so, so again, this is the biggest myth since women stripping their paid tuition. Now, I think I'm ambivalent as well about, I'm ambivalent on this issue as well because I don't think that children who are strictly have an ambition to be an athlete on a professional or collegiate level should be forced to, to feign as if they want to, you know, get an education or, or under, undercation or whatever. Um, and I think that it also offers incentive to some of the children who would otherwise not be in school because sports is the thing that keeps them in school in the first place. So I think, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel ambivalent again on this issue. I don't think it's a, I think it's a bad or a good thing. I, I, uh, the veil's been dropping, but I want you to please explain the, the statement you made about women stripping and paid tuition. Oh, you know, you, you know how they used to always talk about she stripping the pig tuition on it. You know how many nurses have shown right. their titties yeah, just, just to just to be able to be phlebotomist? Whatever. No. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't can, I don't support that statement. <laughs> you just said, literally, you just said it. But anyway, Crystal, you had anything to say on this before we move forward? I have forward? nothing to say on this. <laughs> I'll, I'll, we can I'll just, we can just move forward. So, but why, we, why are we acting as if we don't know that these institutions only want these kids for their athletic abilities, not to educate? Them. No, no one is that. I know. Okay. It's not even. It's not even <laughs> you you just gotta be angry for no yeah, reason, yeah. huh? I wish somebody would cut your beard, make lighter hearted. But uh, mm, so thing. Serena, Wakanda Forever, Williams, uh, is now in the news because the French Open told her that she was banned from wearing a black cat suit um, during the the uh, the French Open. This suit. Uh, Serena has gone on to say was for medical purposes because during her pregnancy uh, she had blood clots that formed and she had a near-death experience. Uh, so this is supposed to uh, be a compression suit that helps keep the blood flowing and her safe. And me excited. The, the, the ridiculous thing about this yeah. is that the, 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 US, the French Open has the audacity to say that this is an inappropriate garment to wear while literally every woman within the federation wears a tutu with booty meat hanging out the side and every time you hear them say ah we look to see what's bouncing i don't see how what she's Not wearing me. that's a full length bodysuit compares to what they would call the inappropriateness when what we see on a day-to-day -day basis is far more erotic and far more self-serving as a viewer than what she had on so I'll, I'll say this on two respects. One, uh, Serena could have not played in the French Open if she chose to, and I think that would have hurt them more. I think she's won enough to where if she hadn't played in the French Open, they suffer more than she suffers. Two, look at it differently. Maybe they say it's inappropriate because she's not showing enough skin. We're thinking they're saying it's not inappropriate because it's sexy and provocative. Meanwhile, they got everybody else showing all this skin that they're saying maybe isn't sexually provocative. But maybe they're saying, hey, you're hiding too much of what we want to see. So put the skirt back on so we can see more leg. Why are y'all scared? Why are you trying to scare the issue? Right? Way too much. You, you know exactly what this is about. That's a very no. Paris you, dinner you, uh, yo, listen, answer from you. Maybe. What are you trying to save white people, man? Listen. I'm trying to save white people. It's because he bro. went to a PWI. To I white went to a PWI, man, but I keep it real. Yeah, thank you, son. I went to So I want to hear what you You visited TSU. I wish these boys Anyway, let's speak to the woman on this. We'll start. Well, actually, we'll start over with Andrea. Who's also a woman. Who's a, who, who happens to be a woman. <laughs> Andrea, what you say, girl? Woman. <laughs> I think it totally has to do with the fact that it's too black. I mean, she she aligned it with being with the whole Wakanda thing. I think that's where they find fault with it. So. Too black. So you, of course that's what it's about. It was a black character. Crystal, do you concur? No, I do. I mean, it's just, just that simple. So y'all not going to expound on that? <laughs> I mean, Full stop. You, I mean... We 
know what it is. Here's the thing. The selective policing of women's bodies has been going on forever oh, by men and women. Oh, and women. Oh, and women. Oh, you took give a, a very no, masculine no, side. No, 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 you, you asked right, me no, to no, express no, it. I welcome you. I'm, I'm listening. You, you asked. Oh, no, here we go. This is the crystal that I know and love. So. Let your curl show, girl. I got you. I got you. So the fact of the matter is, what's interesting to me is, even outside of this, watching some of the conversations that have happened on Facebook, because I've been lurking, just kind of seeing what people have to say. And it's amazing how many men have justified this statement, saying, literally, black men as well, saying, I've seen black men do it. I, I can pull it up as soon as the show's Man, over. I'll pull you up. I, I will. I promise you. All right. Catch me on that. Talking Ooh. about it was inappropriate. She has booty meat jiggling everywhere. But what's funny is we have the selective policing, because they'll watch gymnastics where they're basically in a bathing suit. It's not a problem. You see gymnasts, you see um, people running track, you see NFL players whose stuff is just as tight. NFL players. So they're men, but I'm I'm saying the fact of the matter is the man, no one looks at NFL so, players in that kind of way. So I don't. But let's not go. Wait, wait, you, wait, 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 wait. Ma maybe y'all <laughs> don't. Hey, absolutely. Do. Andrea do. I, I'm just saying, maybe y'all okay. don't. But just throw it out there. So you will not be smirched the name here's, of the NFL. Here's 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 what I think. Honestly, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a dress code. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a dress code, but let's cut the bull. If you want people to wear a certain garment, describe the type of garment they need to wear. If you need them to wear a tennis skirt, say you want them to wear a tennis skirt. If you need them to wear certain colors, tell me you need them to wear certain colors. But just arbitrarily choosing who you want to pick on for random stuff when they're really wearing compression wear, that's where it puts a bad taste in So that's the thing. That's the historical element that needs to be cleared up. This is not without precedent. There was a, oh, a, the, the there was a lady by the name of... So don't, don't, don't no, try No, 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 no. You had your chance. Hold that, that, okay, no, no. This, so, so this is this is the French Open or Wimbledon? This, this is, is no, French no, no, Open. Okay, so and that other one was Wimbledon. That's a whole oh, other thing. Y'all assuming y'all know what the grand point of this... No, no, that's I, a whole other thing. And they told the white woman she couldn't wear it too. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I knew where you're going. It's not just... No, I'm not done yet. Because you guys are saying that just... Your main point, your focal point is that this is about... You know, further evidence of policing of white, blah, 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 of female body, right. which I agree right. to some degree. Right. I don't think that's the main thing driving this, though. I think that this is a, 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 a this is an attempt to rein in the uh, for a, show, a, show, a showcase of black power, like how Andrew said. Because, like I said, there've been times in the past where there've been white women who worn cat suits in Wimbledon and other other venues in tennis, and they've been criticized by the public about it. Right. But this is the first time they've, they've promulgated a policy against it, and it's all because of her tying it in with the black power, kind of the black I'm not disagreeing. I, I said movement. in the beginning I agreed with her, and then I took yeah. it a step further in saying, but it's not, oftentimes there's multiple factors working in one place. Right. And so I think they're policing women's bodies, but I also think the fact that she tied this into kind of a black power situation, I think that was just double incentive to say this is inappropriate. Not say exactly why it's inappropriate. You know, not set those exact standards, but to just say, no, this isn't it. So now you get to guess next week. What is it? Mm. Well, another black woman who has come under fire uh, is a lady by the name of uh, Awesomely Lovey. Uh, that is her, her Twitter handle name. She is a Nija lady, a Nija being Nigerian lady, um, whose who's claim to fame has come through social media uh, being a, a person who discusses what fashion, um, what else does she talk about? I don't, I don't, I don't read. Pop, pop, don't culture. Like pop culture. Pop culture. Okay. Pop culture in general. Pop culture in general. Yeah. Um, and and through, through the last several years of her uh, popularity, she has uh, you know, had, the, had the, 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 the favor of African Americans. And I say African Americans and not just black people because mm -hmm. this issue that we're about to talk about with her brings its derisiveness from the fact that she's an African versus African Americans. Um, she went on uh, Twitter and talked about, um, just had a blunt brain fall. Tevin Campbell. Tevin Campbell, Camp, that's right. Tevin Campbell. For Aretha Franklin's uh, um, homage to Aretha Franklin, they were trying to figure out who should we get, who should we get. And she went on to Twitter and said, Tevin, nah. And that's paraphrasing what she said. Uh, <laughs> and... Black Twitter ran amok, uh, going off on her, talking about her, saying, you don't know black culture, you don't know, well, specifically African-American culture, uh, who are you to open up your mouth and say anything? I, I'm, I don't remember Tevin Campbell getting this much love when Tevin Campbell was Tevin Campbell. How do you think of uh, Has he sung a song in the past 20 years? You, you, she said when Tevin sudden, Campbell was Tevin But Campbell. all of a sudden... I mean, Black Twitter beefed but, but their muscle. But people still love Tevin Campbell. Like, in any conversation about timeless. parties or whatever, people are always like, oh, that's my jam. They'll stop in yes. a moment. You so, play Can We Talk and see what happens. That, that is, that's also a function of nostalgia. 
it, it reminds you of when you first heard it as a child. I mean, I, do I think Tevin Campbell has the vocals to sing a Luther Franklin song now? I haven't heard him sing a new song Man, ever. Man, that's ignorance. In, in the past three years. <laughs> <laughs> Tevin Campbell? Let's ask, when well, last time I heard Tevin Campbell sing? Can he even still sing? Listen. You know, that's a skill you can lose. First yes, of all, he yes, does, he, he's on YouTube, he, and he, 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 he puts YouTube. out videos every now and again. Yeah, he does. So, not naivete or ignorance. You don't know what you're talking about in this. <laughs> Tevin Campbell is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very good vocalist, and I think he can pull it off. I don't know how this, this is definitely, this is definitely a rift between African American culture and somebody who doesn't isn't aware of African American I culture. Think this is I'm actually, not going to say it's a schism between Africans and African Americans, but this is somebody who isn't very ver well versed in African American. Yeah, like I, I disagree with that, and here's why I disagree: because black uh, African American people not will have, yeah, we know. I do. I'm doing what you do. Now, I, I want to let you finish, sir. <laughs> no, nah, I'm, I'm done. You sure? I'm done. Okay, I, I appreciate you. African American people can't agree on culture, pop culture. Mm -hmm. We will argue: should it be Fantasia? Should it be uh, Deborah Cox? Should it be Deborah Beyonce? Cox. Should it be any one of the, these people <laughs> no, singing a, a Aretha Franklin song? And we won't give each other the same type of flack that we're giving her simply because she comes from a different cultural background. They're talking about her staying in your African lane, you don't know black culture, when black people have the same art. There were black people that were also saying, I don't know about Tevin Campbell. You got a black man right here saying, I don't know about Tevin Campbell. In question. Regard oh, my God. Oh my God. <laughs> but what well, the point is, they are, they are honing in on her Africanness simply because that is, to me, the most facile argument that they can make rather than saying, you know what, let's see if she has some merit with her argument. <laughs> I know you. Uh, <laughs> what? Listen, man. <laughs> this, this, it's okay if you love Tevin. No, no, no. More than, I, I'm more, ambivalent to no, 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 more than anything, it's not even about Tevin Campbell. I think, I think we like to tiptoe around the bigger issue. There's an elephant in the room that we're not addressing. This is the reason why this was such a facile argument or a facile target, as you put it, is because people are denying, we've been denying for a long time that there is this animus a, a, a significant amount of animus between African American culture and African culture here in America. It's, it's been that way for. for, for well, you, 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 so you look as though you don't agree. I can, I can tell you some. No, no, I agree with. Example. No, 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 I agree with you. Yeah. I just don't think it applies here. Yeah, I, I think it does. I think, I think this is not something that should trigger discussion about. Oh, you, our disagreement is predicated on the fact that you're not aware of our culture. It's like he said, it's a very facile argument, right? But why does why did they go off on to started a, a, attacking her culture and what did she her identity so is? Here's, here's because it's bent on that. Do you read her? Do you read her blogs? No, I don't. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. I, I hear what you're saying, and I think what you're saying is accurate. I don't think it applies in this situation. What you're saying is that he's ignorant, maybe even <laughs> naive. That's cool. I'm ignorant. And I'm naive. No, 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 like no. it is. I agree with the fact that there there is this unspoken issue, but I don't think that's what's driving this. The fact of the fact matter is. Austin Lee Lovey has driven her career on riding the back of African American culture. Mm -hmm. And she's extremely snarky. Mm -hmm. And she's always attacking and making fun of. And, and I think this is one of those examples where that's the energy you put out. Eventually, when you come off on the wrong end of things, it's going to come back to you. So I think she is literally, it's being reciprocated back to her. So that's she's all reaping what she's sowing. That's sung. literally what it is. Now, her stuff is funny. I can, ha ha, tee tee hee hee. But she's literally receiving back the same type of energy she puts out in her blog. But do you, think, it's, do you think this particular argument is fair, saying that because you're African, that's what I'm saying. Like you should because you have she, nothing she to makes do with all argument. kinds of arguments about because you're white and you're not black, you can't see this. Now, again, it's not that I don't agree, but what I'm saying is she has set this energy. It's almost like when the current occupant of the White House, when he bullies and someone comes back at him, he's like, "Oh, that's not classy." You should. Literally, this is exactly what happened with her. So, yes, people are using the African argument, no, you don't know our culture as well, but this is her, go read her stuff. You'll see that it's just being magnified right back at her. Uh, Actually, there was even, I'll say this, there was even a Nigerian that wrote um, this column, I just pulled it up, Madame Noir saying, Lovey, you're a uh, guest of African American <laughs> culture, act accordingly. <laughs> this is another Nigerian that wrote it. And you know, Janice, Janice Faye uh, said something I, I kind of agree with. She says, Nigerians do it all the time with their superiority complex. Yeah, I, 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 do, oh. I do agree <laughs> with the fact that we, and, and as, as Rod pointed out and as I alluded to originally, there is a derisiveness between the African culture and, uh, and the, the African American culture. Uh, culture in terms of we want to attach ourselves to our Africanness because we don't have the the, the, the knowledge roots of Africa. We, we, we know we come from there, but we don't have the historical context to say, 
I come from this village in this particular part of Africa. Africans come over and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm from the, the Northwest Igbo tribe, you know, over here on this particular region, and you can't talk to me about African things. And when you wear that kent, uh, that kente cloth, which has nothing to do to with... the Black Panther premiere, you know, you know, offended which, which has nothing to do with what you think it does, then you are misappropriating a culture that you're not a part of. I don't think it's fair for you to... Not all of them had that opinion. Yes, there's some that said it, but there were a lot of them that were like, this is cool, we're finally being braced. We went to school, we were bullied by African Americans, called African booty scratches and other things. Now we're popular. So I think you have people on either sides of that argument. I don't think we should just rope them in and say they're all like, oh, you can't borrow from our culture. That's not accurate. So there's diversity of opinion. I'm going to say that from my unique experience in the medical field, where Nigerians make up a very, the, the largest percentage of black uh, physicians at this point in time, that it is palpably clear that Nigerians drive more so of the wedge of like this is, you know, the, we have our thing, you guys do your thing, you know, and and it's and it's very you can you can query other physicians if you don't think it's a no, thing, no, and this is all anecdotal, this is all fact. anecdotal, but we're talking about the here and now, mm -hmm. this thing is real, like, and so I think despite what you have, you have more knowledge about you know, yeah, I, I, body I agree work. with what you're. I but, do think it's a thing. Like I said I just I don't think that's the thing here. Well, black woman, uh, this is the last thing that we want to talk about uh, before we move on to you the, the in total. I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. As a black woman, we, I want you to speak on this, and, and I think Andre, you might be one as well. A black woman? Uh, a black woman? You, you might be. Possibly. You, both y'all are kind of on the lighter side of that spectrum, so we don't know exactly <laughs> what your colorism. Is. We, we don't know how how black are you? How colonizer you really are? But I don't talk uh, about mamas when I do interviews, but you're bringing me really close. <laughs> oh. I think, have you met my mom before? She's not yet. Woman. Exactly. So don't I'm talk sure, about I'm my sure mom. she is. Watch it. Audrey might get you. Watch All it. Right. So anyway, um, the Kardashians are, are setting a new trend. Uh, they, are, they are setting this trend known as glass hair, a.k.a. the silky press that has been around for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Even the great walking Negro spiritual Cicely Tyson has had it. Um, That's so disrespectful. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> I don't know um, how often white people have to be told they haven't originated something before they realize <laughs> they are not original. Uh, I, I, I think it's almost. It, it's, it's the level of disrespect that comes when they try to rebrand something that's that's not their own and take it and appropriate it as if it was something new and novel and, and, and fresh. Um, it, it rises to the level of rage in me that they could do it with such brazen audacity. As a black woman who, who it, it happens a lot within the female culture and the European female culture where they take things over, they took the braids and all of a sudden there was something new. Uh, they've taken styles from, from, from black women before and all of a sudden it's something new. Do, is it, is it flattery is the, the highest form you know, or is it imitation is the highest form of flattery for you or is it keep your own shit or at least give us, pay us our due? I mean, I think for me, I don't know... I think you can appropriate some hairstyles, some, I don't know, it's kind of, for instance, the whole locks thing to me, that's, you typically see that with people of African descent or people of Indian descent. But um, you know what, whenever we talk about Kardashians and the stuff they're doing, a part of me just, just wants to just be quiet. Because it's not even we like worth you. the so energy. We need you to, we need you to Absolutely. focus some of that energy on the, and, and try. No, no, I'm no, just, I'm no, just crystal, saying crystal. No, it's, no, it's no, not. You see what I'm saying? Like it's so ridiculous. Like you just, it's a segue. And it's something that it's going to keep happening. It's been happening forever since you know we saw Bo Derek with the braids and stuff. It's, there's no point even getting mad about it. The best thing you can do is figure out how to sew up these trends and get some type of trademark or whatever legal stuff you need to put on it so other people can't make money off of it. And then go from there. I mean, because it's going to keep happening until you figure out how to be the person making money off these trends I exclusively. Know, I don't know why we keep crying about stuff like this. You know, we live in a very multicultural society, right? Uh, if you want to, th it's funny how we th there's a connotation when we talk about uh, appropriation, cultural appropriation. It usually only goes one way, but we don't talk about how we've appropriated certain ele elements of white culture. We just call it assimilation. Right, because, but nonetheless, if you're in a culture full of different types of people, you're going to adopt certain habits, certain practices and habits from other people. I don't think that's problematic. I do think it's problematic when you claim that you have 
you are the originator of said uh, trend. And that's where the problem comes in. When you don't give credit, you don't pay homage to the person who did it first. That's one of the things people were saying about, uh, what's, the, what's the singer name? Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars, exactly. But Bruno Mars, I don't think it was fair with Bruno Mars because Bruno Mars always pays homage to who he took his styles from. So I think in this culture, we can't cry about the fact that we, we claim our culture is so dominant and all this stuff, but then we get mad when other people want to assume it. Well, I th <laughs> and I think... It to your point, I think we don't necessarily get mad that they are utilizing it. I think they're getting we're getting mad because they are acting like they invented it. I, I said that, and that's what I'm saying. Like I don't think that most most black people aren't upset at the appropriation per se. They're they're upset about the the, the lack of of, of 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 citing to who started it. And I think I think it's more to it than that. I think it, I'm I'm upset when things are appropriated and not cited to the source, and then when a, a black persons especially women, don't get the same uh, benefit or credit as do the white counterpart for this for copying their style. So when you have uh, the cornrows and the braids and, and the thick lips and, 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 and the, the curvy body and on the black women it's like objectified or it's bad or it's ghetto or it's all kind of bullshit, but then you see it on the Kardashians or anybody else or, or whoever that person, Bo Derek was, and all of a sudden now it's a thing of beauty, I have a problem with that. I don't think, I don't even think that's the, I think the, if black people would, if we were making money off of these cultural trends and them assuming our cultural practices, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have a problem with it. But yes. the problem is that we don't mobilize those uh, those creations to our own advantage economically, and that's the oh. problem. We, we can't. I'm not, I'm not going to agree we, with we, that because sometimes I, I, sometimes we're cut off at the knees. We don't always have the same resources. That. So I don't I don't want to no I don't want to say for a second it's that black people aren't trying to make money. I didn't say we, I didn't I didn't we say more trying. We I said don't we don't network. benefit. Well, regardless of what the mechanism is, we don't. Hairstyles, black hair, it's a billion dollar industry. We do not reap the benefits of that, right? So what I'm saying is... Stop about she's happy hair. Stop. I'm saying, I'm not talking about, I'm not arguing the mechanism of how we come to not benefit from our creations. I'm talking about the fact that we don't. If we were making money off of these things, we would not care. Agreed. They make money, we don't. Boom. Absolutely. Science, technology, engineering, math. Those are things that we can start to make money off of, and we have been entering the force to do. Crystal Washington, yes, you are a something of an aficionado in that STEM uh, discussion. Why don't you go ahead and talk to us about exactly what you do and what your forte is? Well, I'm a technology strategist and a futurist, um, which basically means that it's my job to go out to speak to companies all over the world and tell them how they can leverage technology. I do it mostly for sales and marketing, um, but sometimes I talk about future trends as well and what's coming down the pipeline, and, and that's kind of what brings me here today because um, you know the things that are coming down the pipeline in terms of technology and how it's going to impact all of us, especially the African American community, is really significant, and I think that we are in no shape, form, or fashion prepared. Well, tell me more. I'm excited. Totally. <laughs> I absolutely believe that. Keep going. <laughs> well, okay, so, and there's multiple levels to this, but for instance, um, depending on the source that you're looking at, by 2030, it's estimated that anywhere from between 10 to 30 percent of jobs are going to be cut in the United States. Okay, and we know that this is going to impact everybody. And again, it's it's it depends on who you're looking at. It's as low as 10, but I've seen it as high as 30. But you'll always need a lawyer to get you out. And, <laughs> and so um, you you know you know you want to think about who is that going to impact. And so like right now, I think last quarter. The uh, U.S.'s unemployment rate was something like 3.8%. Ours was 6.1%. We're always going to be higher. And so my message to African Americans are, is that we really need to learn how to embrace some of these jobs that are coming down the pipeline because a lot of stuff is going away and it's not coming back. Now, I've heard, I, I think the, the number over in Silicon Valley, something stupid like 3% of, of, of Silicon Valley is black um, or... or well, Three percent on average. I think Facebook has like three point one percent of employees. Google's two percent of employees are African American. Um, so, what what is why is it so low? Because it's not like um, when computers came out and when computers were introduced to the high school systems, black people weren't there uh, right along there with the white students on computers. Because I had one. I'm sure you had one in in, in your class. Why is there such a discrepancy uh, between the two. I don't have a solid answer, but I'll say I have two I have two theories. I think one theory is is that oftentimes some of our non black peers, they not only had access to computers in the classroom, but they had access to the like the Commodore sixty fours and all that stuff in the home, starting from a younger age. So they were able to play around with coding. I always love the Commodores. 
Okay, thanks so much. In I'm C sure Lionel Richie appreciates that. In 64, so um, that was the best year. And, I mean, two of my cousins that are doing really well, you know, in terms of IT work, that was their start, even though they were African Americans, but they were rare. And they were the only black people they knew that were in that type of position. So that's one. Two, I think you have kind of this culture in Silicon Valley where they really only embrace themselves. And so diversity, while they say it is something that's of importance, it's not really being practiced. And so you're bringing in people that are more like you, and that's, that's what's happening. That's why there's not enough women, um, brown people, black people. Do you, do, you think, do you think that part of that issue has something to do with what black people deem as important for their professional lives in terms of uh, music, sports, yeah. all that, and, and saying, you know, we put more focus on these areas, not knowing that there is so much money to be made within the tech field. I think that's probably part of or it, too. Stint. I mean, I think a lot of people really aren't aware of the opportunities or the fact that, I mean, here we are talking about all these tech jobs, and you hear people talking about, oh, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to go to school for that, I don't have the money for that, not even realizing some of the largest tech companies don't even require you to have a four-year degree. You can get a job at Apple. You can get a job at IBM and Google without a four-year degree. All they require is that you've gone to some type of coding camp and demonstrated some degree of mastery of understanding. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to get out there and do it. And you can have access to a lot of these coding camps and things for free online. So right now, you could decide to do this if you wanted to. So Rod, you, you, had a, you have a degree, a uh, professional degree that, that kind of encompasses a lot of what STEM uh, is all about. Surely you did not see a lot of people that looked like you going through the matriculation process. Um, and why do you think that there weren't more people? Because, I mean, even if you're not talking about the Silicon Valley component, we all talk about growing up to be lawyers and doctors. That's a good um, point. Why, why don't we see more of us in that field? So I was a chemistry major initially before I went to med school. And there were absolutely, I was one of two black people in my, my major out of maybe like 20 people. Uh, so yes, that trend is definitely a thing. I think in addition to what was mentioned earlier, because those things are definitely contributory, I think another issue is that we peddle the same misinformation about what's valuable. Or we, 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 for, for black kids growing up, the things, that you can, the things that constitute success are lawyer, doctor, nebulous business, etc. Those things, and then once you, those are the things that you, you hone in on, and if you don't do these things, you're not successful. Meanwhile, in other households, they're more, they have more exposure to other types of forms of, of professions, and success is, is a lot more, less narrowly defined. So I think from a cultural standpoint, we kind of perpetuate the fact that we keep looking for these jobs. Another thing is that there's a, lot, there's a large fear of, of, of the hard sciences in the black community, too, as well. Like, I know a lot of my friends, you know, I say, let me say not, I'm saying African-American community, there's a strong uh, fear of, like, calculus and, you know, all these things that sound like they're rocket science, but really when you delve into it, it's just a process like anything else. But we are, we are kind of shy, we shy away from those things because we don't have a lot of people to, to, to reach back and say, all you got to do is just like anything else, you put your mind to it, you can do it. So that's one of the things. I, I think it's, it's, you know, so I'm wondering if, and I'm just wondering, is this, your saint's fear is just a lack of exposure. Like, if you're the only person in your family to jump into calculus, and, and having taken calculus, it was hard when nobody could help me. So then you, you have to figure it out on your own. Is it more or less a, a ignorance thing or just a straight lack of exposure? It's both. They kind of go hand in hand. They go together. Well, yeah. no, because right. ignorance could be like, don't do math. No, as opposed but you to like, can't uh, have fear. Ignorance is a lack of knowledge. Fear, it's not fear necessarily. Is predicated no, but no, but I mean, what I'm saying is, like, my parents didn't take calculus. They could not help me. But they wanted me in the class. And so they would support me if, if I said I need X, Y, Z to get it for me. But sometimes what I needed was somebody to like help me figure out this part of the math I'm just not understanding. Clarify. And so I would sit in a chair at the table for, for sometimes hours looking at the same equation over and over again, not understanding how to do it. And this was before YouTube, obviously, mm -hmm. before all that kind of stuff. And so it was just, I was just stuck. And so I'm wondering, is it is it a, a, an exposure thing like that? Or is it like another part of the black culture where we don't actually sometimes praise knowledge or the quest of, the quest for knowledge. So it's, it's, yes, I agree with you. Initially, I, I thought you were going in another direction, but I see what you're saying. Let me finish. I know, I know, my, I, I apologize, but you don't, you don't know what you can be unless you've seen it for the most part, unless someone told you or, or, or pretty, there's no, I don't know, you have to have a pretty strong imagination to know that you can be in the green technology field and no one in your life has ever been in that field, no one you've ever spoken to, right? So part of it is the fact that we don't have a large amount of people who are in the community who can 
do, do serve as an example of what you can be and where you can go. That's why we tend to recycle the same kind of professions mm -hmm. in the same lifestyle. So, Crystal, uh, you have a question from uh, Janice Faye. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Janice. Is it Jan Janice or Janice? I don't know. But uh, Janice Faye. I I'm assuming it's probably Janice because it's black. Uh, it's Janice, man. Is it Janice? Yeah. Well, well, look at her being all... A Stanford graduate, by the way. Uh, no one talking shit. No one cares. <laughs> but, uh, Crystal, do you really feel as if your talks are beneficial? Silicon Valley's black startups find it very difficult to raise capital. It seems as if it's like the diversity and inclusion committees. They meet their quota. So, good questions. I'm going to break this in half. Regarding my talks, I don't actually talk typically to African Americans. I'm hired by corporations. My girl. Oftentimes, hey. well, no, no, it's not. No, a, no. Whatever, I'm just saying. I'm so, you so no, I appreciate you. No, I'm just saying. I, I would love to speak to my people more. I just want to make sure I'm not saying that as a point of pride that I don't. Um, so usually I am sometimes the only woman in the whole space. Sometimes I'm the only African American there. Sometimes I'm both. Thousand people. I'm on a stage. I'm the only one that's of color and a woman. And so, yes, I know that my talks make a difference there because I'm actually showing them how to increase their sales and they keep hiring me. So to answer that question, the second piece, though, about black startups having a hard time raising capital, that is a truth, but it's not impossible. Um, for instance, Christopher Francisco, we were actually on a panel together last month. This is a brother that just raised $9 million for his company, Evolute. So it's possible. You just have to learn how to play the game. And I know on the panel he was just talking about how you know, he had to really kind of get outside of his comfort zone and how you work the room. And you have to think like the people there. So unfortunately, it's one of those things where you kind of have to do that code switching thing and figure out how to switch, you know, how to, how to get in there, honestly. Yeah, uh, so you going to read my article? So you bring up a, a pretty, good, <laughs> pretty good point that I want to, and, and Janice kind of ties this in. So we talk about all the time, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. We talk about uh, these multimillionaires and billionaires who we always tell them, you should be doing this with your money. You should be doing X, Y, and Z. You are in a unique position to be a, uh, a gross minority in your particular field. And you are in a position where they listen to you mm -hmm. rather than you having to listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to what, kind of uh, piggybacking off what Janice is saying, do you feel that it's incumbent upon you to make white Americans within that field aware that they need to present more opportunities to black uh, uh, capital venture capitalists or, or STEM researchers? Because a lot of times black people, or I'm sorry, white people will have this whole, well, I never knew type attitude and, you know, I, I just assume that they didn't want to do it. Uh, or should you put yourself in a position to educate them as a part of what you do. I think that's definitely one of my responsibilities, but where things get tricky is I don't actually speak in the tech space. I'm hired by financial services firms. I'm hired by real estate um, brokerages. So typically, even though I speak on technology, I'm speaking on technology to non-technical firms. So when I interact in that space, yes, like I mean, I've, you know, when I met up with one of my friends who was with HR with Facebook a while back, we had a good talk, but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where that's not typically who I have contact with. So that's just my reality. Oftentimes, I'm kind of an interesting example because I show up and they don't even know what to think of me in some spaces. Some of them are fine, but I mean, there's times where I'll give you an example. I've spoke to an association of farmers before on technology. And I'm the only person my age, only woman, only brown person. Only non-farmer. Huh? Yeah, seriously, right? Um, so no, I mean, I do think we have a responsibility to pull people into the space, educate our clients as well. I wish that I did more in the technology space in terms of speaking, but that's just not who my clients are. My mother's a teacher. Uh, she teaches out in Pearland, and she just um, was given a, a nice size grant to do a robotics program uh, out there. I don't see enough of that happening within our inner city uh, urban areas where we have, like, like uh, Damon was talking about, there's no one there to actually teach them the STEM, uh, the, the, the fundamentals of the STEM, STEM process. So we don't, do you think that we need to push more for STEM uh, to be highlighted within the urban community? So I, I actually totally disagree with that statement. Why? There are tons of resources that are out there. The problem is we're aware of them. And so like, for instance, in Houston, we have C-STEM uh, that's directed by Dr. Reagan Flowers. Um, they go all over schools, all over the state, and they have these huge competitions. They support them. They support the school districts. Um, one of my really good friends, uh, Dimitri, I can't think of Dimitri's last name right now, he started a whole, he founded a whole STEM school 
in Indianapolis targeting minorities. I mean, there's resources out there everywhere online. There's scholarships to do coding courses for kids. It's just we don't know that it's there. But you're talking about independent resources. I'm talking about in, in the institution itself. I go to school from nine of them, whatever, I don't know how long school goes nowadays, but one of my classes being something dealing with Oh. Just outside of regular so, biology. Listen, but if, 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 here's an issue with the school system I have, especially in the, in the community. It's one, and that they teach for the test. And whatever the, the current iteration of the test is, TAS, TAS, ITBS, whatever it is, they teach for the test, and they don't teach outside of that test. So whatever, whatever the, anything that's not part of that core test, you're not get taught. Two, I think within the black community, especially the urban community, too much emphasis is placed on escaping that environment via sports or military and not enough on 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 educational pursuits because i can tell you when i grew up in a different time it was i'm, I'm old enough to have been in a different time how kids. old are you sonny so, <laughs> but i was the only right they <laughs> had they had they had programming <laughs> classes in my high school that were advertised i took c plus plus coding classes all that stuff when i was in high school and there were no black kids that showed any interest in it so it's not just a, 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 a it's not just a thing about it being available it's yeah. also about interest and, and knowledge of those things exist in the Because there's saying. clubs and stuff yeah, you can join so, in the school. It's not, no, yeah, there's right. not the regular not courses, just, but they have access to it. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think it's Easily. more than just access with the school because when I was in my programming class in high school, I was like the only black person there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, and, and I got caught a lot of things. Me too. But I think in the within the black family who, who aren't, who, you know, it is what it is, there's not enough emphasis placed on, I think, across the board educational pursuits, across the board, and not just them. But even in literature, just encouraging kids to write poetry and reading books to expand your mind, um, learning history and not just the history of slavery and, and the narrow, narrow aspects of black history, but just history in general. Just to just just an understand history and how it repeats itself. Um, of course, unless you choose to do so in college, there's no philosophy training. There's no education on the thought and why we think. And and what is good and why do people choose to be good and is good even normal just across the board there's a lack of, 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 of pursuit for education and, and, and our, in our community and so I think beyond just having access and more access there needs to be a shift in mindset that there's more ways to escape your situation than sports and football sports well, and military well certainly STEM has uh, been pivotal in, in the current iteration of social interaction vis-a-vis -vis social media um, in its iterations through Twitter, Facebook, everything else we have that, that, that counts as social media now. Um, are we doing enough to intertwine STEM with social media and black people? I'm not understanding that question. Sure. Um, black people, it, it, or let me, let me rephrase this. Students tend to uh, venture into things that entertain them mm -hmm. in terms of learning. Mm -hmm. Um, the more entertained you are by something, the more apt you are to, to want to delve into that particular field. When someone just says science, technology, engineering, math, none of that sounds real sexy for them. Uh, but when you start pairing it with things like, oh, well, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know the apps that you're, that you're currently playing on, you know uh, Angry Birds, all those things, those are... Uh, derivatives of STEM projects, then you start saying, oh, okay, well, I love Angry Bird. You know, so I love what, whatever the fun game is out right now. I love uh, Fortnite uh, or I love whatever. Are we doing enough to marry the derivatives to the progenitors and say, look, this is what makes it sexy? I think that depends on who the we is. The fact of the matter is parents are thrown off base by this technology because they don't even know what's going on. And so it's very hard for them to model. But to give an example, I do think it's important that you share this information with them. Um, and then I know Rob was even talking about having someone modeling. I think you were saying earlier someone modeling this example and, and how this all feeds together. So, for instance, a lot of folks don't know this, but Travis McPhail, who is from Houston, Texas, got all three of his degrees up to his Ph.D. from Rice. He is the guy, African-American man, who was basically in charge of redesigning Google Maps when Apple Maps came on the board to make it a, take it to a whole nother level. So, I mean, there are people out there that are in key positions that have created the technology we use every single day that looks like us. And I do think we just need to do a better job of, you know, drawing that parallel to the kids. But the question is, who is this we when the parents are uneducated themselves on it? 
And so it's, it's kind of a horrible conundrum, right? Because you, you want to say, okay, well, parents should know. And then some of the teachers, honestly, aren't that tech savvy either. And so it's like, what do we do? Who's in charge of this? Good point. So, I mean, if you had one thing to, to say uh, about STEM, uh, that you wanted every African American to, to, to understand in its importance, what would it be? Your future depends on it. There we go. And <laughs> that was no, some heavy no, shit there. Yeah. Well, no, no. no. Okay, go for it, and then I have something to answer. No, go, go ahead. I want you to finish. No, and when I say your future depends on it, I'll give you an example, okay? So are we all familiar with this whole fight for 15 thing? We have people fighting for minimum wage to be $15 yeah. an hour. Yeah. Okay, so you have people fighting for jobs that aren't even going to exist in the next five years, yeah. right? They're literally, because McDonald's said by 2020, yeah. they're going to have those machines and all this. And here's another thing, Uber. People think they know what Uber is. Uber is not a ride-sharing service or part of the service economy as other apps are. For the longest time, Uber was bleeding red. They were underwriting 60% of every ride. Ask yourself, why would a company, un a company underwrite 60% of every ride? Now, while this is going on, you have these taxi drivers that are fighting with the actual Uber drivers, right? You have all over the world these taxi drivers staging protests. They're fighting them. The fact of the matter is both sides are fighting for jobs that don't exist because Uber's end game has always been about automated vehicles mm -hmm. and autonomous vehicles. And so... We when I say your future depends on it, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of jobs that are going away. Not only unskilled, but middle class jobs. It's taking some surgeon positions. It's taking some financial services positions. It's making an impact in law when it comes to certain areas in there as well. So no one is safe. So no, my point is that no one is safe. And the, and the problem is you have people from Silicon Valley that are saying things like, oh, well, sure, it's going to take away jobs, but it's going to create just as many jobs. Class. Well, that's cool. Well, it might even be true, right? But, not but, it, but the dude who's, the, who's used to drive a taxi, he's not going to be the one programming this new Which is what device. happened to coal miners in, in saying that, hey, you can go ahead and learn this new job. But they're like, well, we are capable of learning the, these new jobs because we're at the point now where you're asking us to relearn 20 years worth of experience <laughs> and do it when I have to feed my family right now and you just took away my job. And then the other problem with African Americans, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll oh, give the floor to you, uh, the other problem with African Americans is that, you know, historically, when we go to any of these big conventions from any of our associations, I won't even say any names, right? You go there and they talk about white statistics, black statistics, and what we need to do to catch up with them. The fact of the matter is, with all this technology that's coming up, Everyone is unprepared. It's going to hit white folks, black folks, brown folks, red yeah. folks. So we can't aim to catch up with them anymore. We're, that's a sinking ship. We have to figure out a new trajectory. And so when you said the one thing, that's why I said you, your future depends on it. Learn this or die. Yeah, there are a lot of ideas I have. Like I think of very credible ideas that I can't even bring to fruition because I don't have the requisite skills to do so because they're all so based in tech, mm -hmm. right? But uh, to, your, to your question that you posed to her, I'll give you my, my answer. I think that we have to be honest enough about ourselves, right? We need to, we need to attach to these new, these new fields what we value most. We need to attach to our values. We need, to, we, need to, we need to impress upon these kids that are coming up how much money is in this stuff as well. And, and, and I think you need to talk, I think we need to, we need to think about, you know, making this a little bit more sexy. Like, a lot of people don't think about some of the, I was a nuclear engineer in the, in the Navy. And, you know, when we get out of the Navy, after you get in, like, a two-year college degree, like, a college uh, trade, trade degree, you can go and make six figures, a lot of money. You don't, it doesn't require a lot of debt. But kids don't know about it. But if you told them what kind of money comes with that, then maybe they would be more inclined to venture outside their comfort zone. So I think we need to start, you know, addressing the values that we have. Well, I mean, that, that goes back or, or to just the whole incentivize it. You need to just incentivize the STEM and all that kind of stuff. Because I don't think everybody chases money. But, but what do you mean by incentivize? Shit, everybody well, chases well, money, because bro. Because you, you, you know, like you know. Well, teachers don't chase money. Exactly. Like, no, you, there's there's money in every field, but there's not millions and billions of dollars. And, and the work I do, I love, but I'm not going to be a millionaire. I am not. I've accepted that fact a long time ago. Hey, friend, you stick with uh, me and I'll get yeah, you there. Yeah, well, that's true. Or with me, my little brother. No, no, no. Uh, you work for the government. Anyway. You won't ever get there. So, <laughs> maybe. The point I'm making <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is, is why did you incent just Broke incentivize <laughs> education and, and across the board in whatever respect? And I don't think it should be limited to STEM. I really don't. Uh, although I do think STEM is a vital. The crystal is who we're talking about, fool. We're talking about STEM right now. Crystal's so, talking, God dang it, you talk talking about, about STEM. Fourth rank, the black people. Okay? And STEM is you a got, you're talking about arts and, and, and poetry. And arts and crafts. We're talking about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Philosophy, All right? History. You history, shut your face, you non STEM person. So, uh, Crystal. Um,
I know that you, 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 you are also an author. I think I said that at the beginning. Yes. Tell me what we need to read. Well, I strongly suggest that you read One Tech Action. And this book is really about how you as a professional can use technology to find a job, get more clients if you're in your sales position, or really even just from a home perspective, how can you use technology to be more efficient, effective, and connected in general? And it's not written in techies. So if someone is 60 years old and doesn't consider themselves to be techie, but they want to learn how to use devices to make their lives better, this is a really good resource. Available on Amazon. Well, see, I, I see Rod is going through menopause right now, so uh, we'll try to uh, wrap up here for him. But um, I want to I want to say awesome. I mean, I don't know too many of us that are walking around here writing books, uh, speaking to the masses. Uh, I think you travel around the world, too. I mean, you are... You are a force to be reckoned with. She so a, she a black girl. Now? Are we black girl now? She, 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 she's not, but she is a black girl with magic. Uh, we will. We've had too many black girls with magic lately, so we need to. Today we have a black man with some magic on his. Uh, and I'm glad you guys brought that up because today's black magic is Maurice Robinson. He is a three-star athlete and one of the top football prospects in the state of Alabama for the class of 2018. Uh, he had more FBS offers than he has fingers, including one from arguably the greatest college football coach, Nick Saban, over at uh, Bama. But Mr. Robinson decided to spurn Alabama, include, and along with LSU and Florida, in favor of going to GS, GS, GSU, a.k.a. Grambling State University. Um, this goes all the way back to our conversation that we had, I think, week one, week two. Janice had plenty to say on it. Um, and <laughs> matter of fact, she, she does everything. Yeah, as she did. And you know what? With, without people like Janice, without people like uh, Mr. Plowden, Mr. McCary, um, who else speaks a lot on John A. Parrish? Uh, John A. Parrish, sure. Okay, <laughs> we'll let that ride. Shout out. There are some people on here that are always on here talking, and without people like them, uh, we wouldn't be where we are, and without you sharing what you share, we wouldn't be growing at the rate we're growing. But I say that to say, uh, well done, Maurice Robinson. You are black magic this week. If we get more like him, can we get the change that we want? within the athletic fields of HBCUs? No. Yes, but we have, we have to do our part, too. We have to go out and purchase the jerseys. We have to go out and, and, and subscribe to ESP and HBCU. We have to go out to the games, support these athletes. And, and we have to play our part, too, because none of this is going to survive without them being a viable economic product. So, so no. God, man, I, man, I need a, you to. You're a defeated. You're man. a mean one, Mr. Grinch. So, no. I mean, I, I need you to be more than just the angry black man your, that your, Rod has made you into. Your, your question, to answer your question, no. I think we can accomplish everything you want without him if we got did everything Rod just said we can do. Support the school. We don't need this man. But they are the people that... No, they, if you can support your school without... If you supported your school through and through, then you wouldn't need the catalyst. It's not just the alumni we're talking about. I never went to Grambling, but I'm going to watch a Grambling game and buy a Grambling jersey. We, they have to have a viable product. So now that they have a, 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 a blue-chip athlete going to that school that can possibly make the game more exciting at the HBC level, now you're going to draw on the people from the, from the communities that are external to Grambling. That's what, it, that's what you need to make these schools survive. Okay. The only thing that's, that's helping the yeah, black on, sports... Uh, specifically football survive right now are the bands I mean we, you, let's be let's be real and honest about it bands are the lifeline through which uh, HBCU sports maintains its validity without the Maurice Robinson's coming in to validate the actual sports program itself you're not gonna get the type of, 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 of fiduciary infusion that you're looking for because the quality of play isn't there to make us want to watch it. You don't have the Vince Vince Youngs going over there to watch uh, to, to throw the ball. You don't have. They don't even catch the ball when you watch the college football game in a, at a at a swack uh, uh, football game. They're throwing deep, and you might see twenty percent of the passes being caught because the level of skill is not there. So Rod is spot on with that. With your blue chip players, in bring your in the dollars. In your opinion, no, it's. A, I mean, in the opinion of years and years of people not uh, watching. I disagree, but continue for it. All right. cool. I'm getting cool. a Grambling jersey, so that's all I'm just going to say that. You should get a TSU jersey since you're here. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, uh, young lady, you have been a pleasure, a delight, a breath yeah. of fuchsia of air for us to have <laughs> on the air today. With the matching lips. Uh, Andrea, 
quiet has kept. You are quietly keeping us on point. So talkative. <laughs> it, she almost me imitation is life over here because the same level of talkative she had right now is the same level of talkative she has <laughs> every day <laughs> in life. <laughs> I swear she probably knows sign language and just speaks uh, <laughs> to us that, that, that way. But, um, Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed the show for today, uh, Crystal. I hope you've enjoyed your time with us, yes. and we want to have you back on. I mean, it is... Hey, Chris, I like you. Thank you, are, you. I like you, too. We, we, we've had women on the show uh, before, but I want to say that you are... Uh, probably because I'm biased because you're my, you're my friend, but uh, I really enjoyed you. Thank uh, you. And I didn't get to say hi to Genesis last week, so uh, Genesis was, Genesis was uh, you did a great job last week. I'm, I hate that I couldn't be here with you guys last week, but I want to go on air and on the record of saying y'all got you guys did a uh, fabulous job um, in my absence. And Rod, again, man, I don't know where we would have been last week sure without you. Up, Damon certainly wouldn't know where he would be right now. I wouldn't, wouldn't know who I was. <laughs> <laughs> but you are somebody, sir. Thank you. And you I, have, are, I have a name. You are Damon Leroy Parrish. The second, third, or fourth. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is our time this week on uh, intelligence. Please make sure that you are sharing. You are passing on the information. If you like us, if you love us, if you hate us, uh, we really don't care. We just want you to make sure that you are uh, sharing with us, about us, to your friends, to your family. You can go on www.gentspodcast.com. Dot com. Yes. <laughs> that boy getting it, boy. Uh, and that's where our website is. You uh, Through the website, you can get to our YouTube channel. Subscribe on YouTube. We've got Facebook. We've got Instagram. Our IG name is Gents Podcasting. Correct. Boy, that boy. I'm not going to remember this next week, I promise you. Uh, make sure that you are following us everywhere. And please, as we continue to grow, uh, we want you to continue to know that we love you. Uh, Next couple of weeks, we have uh, some new software we're going to be rolling out. So this whole um, paranormal activity type of uh, uh, camera angles that we have is going to be phasing out. We're going to be bringing up some new graphics, new everything. I'm excited about it. You guys should be excited about it. Um, intelligence bring you knowledge with the power to change. We will see you next week.